Good morning, welcome to Ag Talk in a Row, where I talk all about agriculture and other things. Like my empty cup of coffee. Doggone it. Alright, so yesterday, um, well, day before yesterday. Well, let's go back. What is today? Sunday. So, Wednesday. Wednesday morning, I got up 4 o'clock in the morning. I think I've already talked about this, but uh, we're going to talk about it here. Got up for about 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe it was 3.30. Took off with a load of hay down to the mushroom barn. Dropped the hay off, loaded up with spent, came back, dropped that off, and then me and my father jumped in his car and casually drove to Oklahoma. Yes, all the way to Oklahoma. 1,438 miles from home is what that was, the way we went. Uh, yep, paid the bill, picked up the motorhome, I drove the motorhome back, dad drove his car back. Not an ideal situation but the the problem we had was we could not get the uh, we could not get enterprise to accept a car in Oklahoma they don't need more cars in Oklahoma and I mean it's understandable because there's really not that much tourism in Oklahoma there's nothing there really uh, unless you like cattle and oil wells and uh, there are some parks that are nice and stuff and I do have those uh, on here someplace uh, I could probably, I do actually have my trip to Oklahoma here, and maybe on my Only Farmer channel I'll put that up. But uh, yeah, so <coughs> yeah, so that was it, and got back day before yesterday. We got back on Friday night, so we left on Wednesday, back here by Friday night. Yesterday I worked, you know, yeah, I went a little bit late to work, but I went, I worked, and. Uh, it was just a few things that needed to be done, and uh, I'm going to go back to work right now. It's actually almost 9 o'clock. I'm still lazy, uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Gearing up for spring. We, I really, truly need to get some of this stuff done. Uh, uh, waiting for parts. Uh, shipping is a pain in the ass from Germany uh, for chrome bits and pieces, uh, at least... I think they're coming from Germany, but it'll be here this well, it'll be here this week. Should be here, but maybe Wednesday uh, to finish up the baler that's in there. It is raining right now, uh, so really can't do anything in the field. Uh, so I'm just going to run hay and bring compost back, or just go get compost. Whatever I have to do, I'll do it. <clears throat> you know, it's not that big a deal. The uh, you know equipment needs to have oil changes and stuff like that, which is going to have to happen pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I got to get some oil ordered in from Schaefer's. I'm a little bit behind on that order, and who knows? It'll they'll ship it freight. I just got to make the phone call tomorrow and get that engine oil in here. Usually buy 110 gallons of engine oil and uh, run out before the end of the year. So I should probably buy three of them. What is that? 165 gallons. Yeah, yeah, whatever. 100. And, yeah, 65 gallons, 165 gallons. Probably be better to do it that way anyway. I like the Schaefer's oil, uh, but I'm kind of behind. Uh, this motorhome thing really screwed me up. Um, I'd had that walk-in floor two weeks ago. I'd had, you know, it just, it just really screwed me up. Lewis having COVID screwed me up, which it's not his fault. It, it, it is what it is. Uh, that, that thing is a sneaky bastard, and it gets you when you're least expected, so... Yeah, but anyway, uh, that's what the deal is. What? Yeah, anyway, <coughs> that's what the deal is. It's just now we're getting into rain, which is going to make dropping off uh, compost a little more difficult. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the hell I'm coughing about. Uh, it's going to make that a little bit more difficult. And, uh, you know, you just deal with it, bring a tractor to the field and, and do that. Uh, you know, pull it out. Just back it in, pull it out. Back it in, pull it out. It's, it gets greasy. And I don't have super good tires on that on that uh, truck. For mud, I mean, they're good for highway. It's not a big deal. They're a cold shoulder tire. If I had a hot shoulder tire, it would probably come out of there a little better. But I don't. I don't have cold shoulders on there. Um, the, uh, they're, they're a good, uh, they're good tires, just not 
for off-roading unless it's dry. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the walking floor trailer that I bought and uh, you know that's that's good because uh, I am going to show how we load it. It works very well. Uh, this trailer, I could not get an extraordinarily tall trailer. I didn't want one. Uh, there's just no uh, use for it. They can't get over it at the at the composter. They can't get over to dump it. And they'll hit, they're afraid of hitting the hoops. Um, I think they'll come really close, but I let the air out of the bags and drop it down. And then they, they he could dump it, but he's really careful. The loader operator. Um, I could bet I could probably pull the hoops out that are up there. It's, it's a pain in the ass to do that because I just. It's just a pain in the ass to do that. It'll cause flap in the uh, in the tarp when I get on the road, and I don't want to do that. But uh, anyway, uh, it holds. We put 20 bales in there. I could put more in, um, but we just stack them too high and walk them forward. You put 20 bales in there, and you have like 13, 14 tons in the in the truck, in the trailer. So it's fine. Now what I could do is set two bales on edge walk them up and then slide one bale on top and then keep doing that and keep them tight but that'd be a pain in the ass for the loader operator when they do come out because he waits till they come out and grabs them and then stacks them grabs and stacks grabs and stacks it's pretty quick and it works out just fine but um you know it's not uh it's not a uh you got to be comfortable for every. Everybody's got to be comfortable doing with a walk-in floor. So I'll just put 20 bales in it and be happy with what I take down because it's like this dual purpose. I take the hay down. Yeah, it's cheaper to run it down with only 20 bales in it because you know the truck is 475 horsepower, it just rolls. Uh, then I load up with the compost at the maximum, with the maximum amount that I can put in there, and life is good. You know I. And drag it home. So I come home heavy, uh, you know, heavy, 80,000 plus or minus. Uh, when I go just a little bit over, you know, um, no big deal. It's within percentage. So because we don't have, I don't have the ability. Well, they do. They could scale it out. I know what it weighs when we leave. And uh, But anyway, I don't have to cross any scales on the way home. I cross scales on the way down. So, you know, I'll put 20 bales in there. I'll roll across their scale. No big deal. And we're, we're good to go. Uh, so that's just the way it is and uh, but it's working it's it's working well I need to get somewhere around 60 loads of this material home in the next month uh, month and a half month six weeks I mean literally I need to get a lot of material home and I'm hoping I can do it in the time that I need to do it but I, I just don't I don't think I'm gonna get it all home I'm just gonna you know do the best that I can with what I've got and uh, shoot for the moon next year. Uh, just keep bringing every load I take is going to go on that walking floor. Every single load, it's going to be compost, 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 compost. So take 20 bales down, bring a load of compost back, and that should work. Uh, I like it when it's broke down a little bit more than fresh out of the barn. Personally, that's just my opinion. It's better um, because uh, it just I had really good luck with it. And I need to put that organic matter back in the soil because the former farmer on that property, well, the one property and the a new property that I have, um, that one is just neglected to the end of the earth. There is nothing there. And I'm going to put corn on it. I just, I was going to get soil test today, but that isn't working out too well because, well, let's face it, it's pouring rain right now. Uh, soil testing is very important if you're going to be growing a crop in the... Uh, in this area maybe not so much out west where they're pretty you know you, you don't have to test every year you can, I mean some guys do but there's a lot of people that don't test every year it's like one in five you know take a test to see what's going on because they're growing a rotation of corn soybeans corn soybeans corn soybeans and possibly wheat in there every once in a while so you pretty much know how much comes off of those fields to put back what you take off you know and it's pretty simple that way uh, most people anymore do not do uh, nutrient management or nutrient building. Uh, if I'm worried about doing nutrient building and losing a piece of property because it gets very expensive. It's easier to build a base in your soil than it is to 
you know, just put on the bare minimum. And the, you know, it's not as available when you put the fertilizer on right away. You know, it's like, okay, so I'm going to put fertilizer in a row. If I need, just say you need on that farm, I need 60 units of potash to grow a, a crop. 60 units of potash. So a unit is a pound. Uh, so I need to put 100 pounds of product on to get that 60 units or six, yeah, approximately 60 units. Uh, that 60 units is not available today. It's not. It takes a little while for it to break down and become available for the plant. It's the same thing with the phosphate. Nitrogen's available right away unless you're using the ESN or uh, or something with an inhibitor, you know, uh, whether it be sulfur-coated. Sulfur-coated actually reduces the release rate because uh, I think the sulfur is a, a bacteria, um, microbicide, and uh, microbacteria doesn't grow and break down, or it doesn't live there, and it doesn't break down fast enough. And I've used that; those are your nitrogen, what they call nitrogen stabilizers. Um, they actually are a microbicide or a, a bacteria side, or, yeah, microbicide, uh, and it kills all of the bacteria around that nitrogen, allowing the nitrogen to seep in, and then. As that microbicide dies or disappears, dissipates, then the microbes can come back in and break down that nitrogen, allowing it to be absorbed by the plant. That's what a nitrogen stabilizer is. Uh, it's what it is. So, years ago, I put down uh, with stream bars or stream nozzles on my hardy sprayers. I thought it was doing great. The problem was that. We were using that nitrogen stabilizer, and you would see streaks of green. And then in between, you would see just not so green, not it was just yellowish. Well, the fact of the matter is, the green was where was the space between the stream bars, where the microbicide didn't kill the bacteria in the soil, and it allowed, that's where the green was, so that nitrogen would hit, kill everything in those rows where it hit, and then the green was in the middle where it didn't hit. So it was like, man, and my yields did suffer in hay because of that. I stopped using them. I stopped using them. I stopped using the bars. I uh, stopped using the uh, microbe or the, the stabilizer, which we were using. God, what were we using? We were using Agrotane and we were using Nutrisphere. We did both of those. Uh, I don't recommend them. I really don't. Uh, at least in this soil, now maybe in sandier soils it's not so such a, an issue, <coughs> but uh, if you're going to use anything, use uh, ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, ESN in your urea. Uh, ESN is a wax coated or even a, even a sulfur coated urea if, you, if you're short in sulfur. And I can almost guarantee you, everybody in this country is short on sulfur because we no longer burn coal for generating electricity, not much of it anyway, and they've taken the sulfur out of the diesel fuel. So diesel, when you burn diesel fuel, all those trace elements that we would normally get from pollution are no longer, you know, from diesel fuel and coal, it goes to the ground. Gasoline is a hydrocarbon, it goes up. Uh, it goes up. So it's a lighter, the exhaust from gasoline is lighter, it goes up into the atmosphere. So but diesel fuel is heavy, it comes to the ground. Uh, we don't get that anymore. No more sulfur, no more, yeah, no more sulfur. So if you are doing soil testing, do check for sulfur, look at your sulfur levels, and uh, ammonium sulfate is a good, is probably the best way to get sulfur levels spiked back up. I use a fair amount of it uh, because I, uh, I just, I use a fair amount of it because uh, we have low sulfur levels. Years ago, we didn't have nearly the problems because we're in New Jersey and everything from the west falls on the east and uh, the prevailing winds is from the west. And, you know, if it, the California pollution falls before the Mississippi River, the Chicago, the, you know, all those other cities that are this side of the Mississippi River, they fall on us. And uh, it used to be if you worked a piece of equipment like the combine you know you go through the year the combine knocks the paint off the the corn heads are nice and shiny uh get one rainstorm acid rain would rust it well that acid rain was uh you know sulfur <laughs> and whatever else was in the air and uh, we don't get that anymore it doesn't rust like it used to i mean it would rust 
like rust and it, we don't get that anymore so the air is definitely cleaner than it was in the 80s and 90s definitely cleaner uh, I bought a combine out of Iowa back in 2000 right 2000 yeah I think it was in 2000 and it had set outside in Iowa but the inside the grain tank was as whistle clean as fresh steel off the mill um, brought it home we had a little bit of a uh, uh, spritz of water, you know, rain, little shower, and the whole inside of the tank turned red rust. That easy. That's how much acid we had at that time. Now, I know, I mean, just overnight, it rusted overnight. Now, if it happens today, like the grain augers that sit outside, because nobody puts them inside, but a grain auger sits outside, the, the flooding at the bottom is nice and polished, used to be rust just like that, rust right up. Now, I could go over to the farm right now, look at the polished uh, steel, because it's still polished. It doesn't rust like it used to. So, if you're going to do your soil testing, check, check your sulfur levels, zinc, uh, manganese, magnesium, all these different, different uh, elements, trace elements. You can add trace into, ooh, it got dark. You can add trace elements into your soil or into your fertilizers, and uh, I have done that. Last year I did that, and uh, quite happy. I was quite happy with it, with the results of it. Uh, you know, uh, I couldn't be unhappy with what I got. If I was unhappy with what I got, I would not be planting corn again this year. So, anyhow, um, on the better ground that I have, I will, you know, the better ground that I have, I will be using more compost and less commercial fertilizers uh, because there's a lot of... A lot of nutrients in that compost. Uh, I'm not going to give the analysis out. Uh, if you're suave, you can find it online. Um, I'm not giving the analysis of the compost out because it would take me too long, and I don't care. Uh, I know what's in it because I have it, and I'm just not into, you know, I'm not into sharing that information. Uh, I don't need a run on the uh, a run on the compost because fertilizer price is getting high, and and uh, not that a lot of people would be close enough to get it at a at a uh, well let's put it this way because I'm a vendor I get it for less and I don't pay much for it and I'm happy about that um, <clears throat> if I wasn't a vendor it would be you know marginal would I do this or not but the the crazy thing is there's a lot of people going in there and getting this stuff and they're reselling it for garden centers and things like that or, uh, to mix into their soil for potting soil for their plants for um, you know uh, homeowners I guess uh, actually I had a call from a friend this morning and he's coming to get two wheelbarrow loads for his vegetable garden I told him where it was he's like oh, okay cool thank you and he took it lifelong friend I mean met him in kindergarten known him for geez 43 years 43 years 43 years and I'm not charging him for it, but uh, anyway, yeah, because it was just what was left in the bottom of the trailer. Uh, what else would I going to say about that? Uh, yeah, soil testing. Uh, the other thing is there is a there is such a thing. If you don't know about soil testing, um, you can pull soil tests and not even know how to read them. You can look down the sides of them and be like, oh well, I've got plenty of copper, I got plenty of zinc, I got plenty of sulfur, I got plenty of this. Well, there's uh, a very important part of that and that is pH your pH which is the acidity of your soil plays a big factor in the uptake of those nutrients okay if you have a low pH uh, there's two things that are going to happen to you not may happen to you but are going to happen to you one is all those nutrients that are in your soil may not be available to your plants. Uh, pH and, and clay content, uh, the lower the pH and the higher the clay content, the harder it is for those plants to grab those nutrients and use them. So you really need a, new, a pH of no less than 6.4. If you get below 6.4, um, your plants are going to start to suffer. It's going to start to cost you more in fertilizer to get that as available nutrients to that plant. All right. Now compost, I shouldn't even talk about the compost because no, no, not too many people have use, you know, of, of the availability to it. But 
I will say this, the compost, the nutrients are available, readily available, and they are available for throughout the season as the compost breaks down. And those roots will go right to it and grab it. Now, the one thing about compost is it takes nitrogen to break the compost down. All right, so if you're looking at this like, wow, I got a nutrient pack here in the compost that is top shelf, right? It's up here. And there's nitrogen in that compost. Funny thing about the nitrogen that's in the compost is that the composters put that nitrogen in the compost, and that is to aid in the decom decomposition process. So that nitrogen that is in the compost, you're not going to get that in your plants. You're just not. You may get a portion of it, but it's not, it's not there. So that nitrogen is there to decompose the, 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 the compost. Now, if, you, if your goal is 250 bushels of corn to the acre, your goal is 250 bushels to the acre. Just think about this. For every bushel you want to produce, you got to put a unit of nitrogen, a pound of nitrogen. So last year, my goal was 220 bushels to the acre. Okay, on some of the ground I got over 300. All right, some of the ground I got below 200, but I was always in that 175 to 300 bushel range. By the time it was done, my average was 216 bushels to the acre. On only I only did 140 acres, so this year we're more than doubling that, and that's fine because it was the plan. See how it goes. Get the bin up and running. And the trailer that I bought is going to be hauling grain, wet and dry, to and from the, from the field to the mill and everything. And I'm going to sell uh, through a couple of other companies that I, that I work with and have worked with over the years and have a good relationship with. So that's just, that's me. And it has to be done. It has to be done. That's just the way it is. So the pH level is very important. Now, you can... You can slip past the pH. If you got soil that's below uh, 6.4 and you haven't got a ready source of lime uh, or soil conditioner to bring the pH up to that level, 6.4 to 6.8 is ideal for growing corn and soybeans. Um, I like 6.8 better than 6.4. Uh, but the compost has a product in it that will allow nutrient uptake uh, below 6.4, which I have some ground that is below 6.4, and I am getting lime. I just haven't gotten to it yet. I'm trying to get eggshells. I want eggshells terribly, and I, I have a phone number, and I'm going to call that tomorrow. And I have a couple phone calls that I have to make, but tomorrow is my eggshell phone call day. Uh, eggshells work really good because that is where I got well over 300 bushels to the acre, where I put eggshells. And yes, I put eggshells. I don't know if you saw me do it on a video, but I did. Um, there's a farm over that I rented from the county and someone had put eggshells there and never spread them and uh, I just went and grabbed a load of eggshells uh, we're looking at probably 10 15 tons of eggshells that I grabbed I put them on the lower end and let me tell you where the lower end was holy moly it was good but in the compost there's a product that they use it's gypsum okay now gypsum will not raise or lower the pH. It will maintain your pH, I guess. It won't change the pH, but it will allow the nutrients to be slippery from the clay particles, and the plants will then be able to to uh, to to take up that those nutrients. So that's a plus with the uh, with the gypsum. I still would like to get some lime in there as well, and I will, uh, whether it's eggshells or whether I got to go up to Martin's Creek and buy ten dollar a ton gray lime that is really fine talcum powder and uh, I can get that it's no big deal what I'll do is I'll leave the tarp out of the uh, I'll well I won't even leave the tarp but what I'll do is I'll take a scoop load of uh, compost put it on the back end of the trailer and then walk it forward once it gets all the way forward then I'll put the uh, tarp down and then get them to put a uh, 20 ton of lime in there and then I'll I'll bring it home and drop it off now 20 tons I only need a ton to the acre uh, there's a lot of people out there that think, oh, well, if your pH is below 6.4 or 6.2 or 6.1 or 5.8, you need to put two ton to the acre. Well, I'm here to tell you that 
I was always taught, and I was taught by some of the people that have told me, you really need to hammer this with line, like now, get it all on now. Well, this line will only break down at a certain rate, and that's it. If you put two ton or three ton to the acre, which they want me to do from the fertilizer plant on two of these farms, if you do that, you will get no more benefit than if you put a ton to the acre, all right, per year. Uh, so I'm sure there's some guys at the fertilizer plant that are just screaming at the screen right now, but that's okay. Um, my grandfather did it. I did it. My father did it. We did it on alfalfa. We used to grow some wicked alfalfa. Did it on soybeans. Did it on corn. A ton to the acre per year. Uh, so, and that will raise your pH. It'll raise your pH, and you will be a happy man. Ton, ton and a half to the acre. No more than a ton and a half to the acre, because uh, you're not going to benefit from it. You come in the next year and you do it again, and uh, after you get three years in, one, two, three tons to the acre. Over the course of three years, you don't have to look at that pH for several years then. Uh, I've even done a half a ton to the acre and been very happy with the results because you don't want to spike that because there's always a spike. Oh, there's always a spike with, with uh, uh, lime. So you put it on and boom, it goes up and then it comes down, the spike, you know. So boom, you put it on, you chisel plow it in and then it comes back down. Usually in that, you know, in that nine month range. <clears throat> So you got a line. I'm going to use my hand here, and you have to watch. So I put it on. Boom! It goes up, and nine months it comes back down, and it's here, right here. And then next year you boom, and then it comes back down again, and it's here. So every time it spikes, it'll always come back down a little bit, but then it goes up again, and then down a little less, and down a little less, until you're at that goal of six four to six eight. And it will maintain that. And then, of course, after this, the nine months goes over, then she'll start to drop again and so on and so forth. And that's, that's how that works. Um, the second thing that happens with low pH, and uh, that, that's one of those things that a lot of people don't really understand. Why is it that when you put herbicide on field A, it works perfectly, and then you go down to field B and... Eh, you get a few mixed weeds, and then you go to the farm down the road where you know that they haven't had lime on it in like 20 years, and a pH, you pull a test, and the pH is 5.4, 5, 5.5, 5, and you're like, uh-oh, this isn't good, and your weed control is deplorable at best, so you're going in with a recovery, all right, so, and this is the, this is where you really need to get smart about your, your, liming or your your pH in your soil. So we all know that herbicides expensive. Sprayers are expensive, tractors are expensive, fertilizers expensive, lime not so much, but that herbicide bill. Okay, so you go in and you put your herbicide in it costs you let's just throw a weird number out there. Just say it costs you $15 an acre for the for the herbicide. All right? And you're a, you're a smart farmer, you're using a stacked um, a stacked variety of seed that has, you know, both Liberty or Liberty and Roundup resistant genes in it. You're in that area. You're like, man, there's weeds. They're starting. The grass is starting to come. According to this high, grass is here. This is definitely going to impact my yield in the end. We really need to take care of this. So you come back in with a recovery, and it costs you say six to eight dollars an acre if you're spraying it yourself it's going to cost you four to six dollars an acre um, just in the herbicide or the, the roundup itself with the surfactant that you're going to put in it and a little bit of array that you're going to put in there just to make it work a little better and uh, you're going to run over some corn which is going to impact you just say four to six dollars an acre for that now if you you have to hire somebody to do it it's going to cost you um, eight to twelve dollars an acre, eight to ten, eight to twelve dollars an acre in there to recover that. So a ton of lime is ten bucks if you get it from a quarry. Uh, if you get eggshells, you can pretty much get them for the trucking cost, so they're pretty reasonable. All you need is a spreader of some sort, which you can rent from somewhere or 
you maybe you've already got one. As a matter of fact, a side slinging uh, shit spreader will do a, an okay job with eggshells. It's not going to be accurate, but it'll work. Um, you can do that. Uh, so, if it's going to cost you that that eight to twelve dollars an acre, you've paid for your ton of lime in the recovery cost of your herbicide and possibly the the, the custom operating rate for those for that for that recovery. So you're there. Uh, and the great thing is, if you only put it on one year and you put a ton of lime to the acre and you raise it up and it actually stays above that six four uh, pH, uh, you can get two or two year uh, at least two years without worrying about your herbicide not working as well as it would if you were already there at that level of pH. So that's food for thought. Uh, lime is very important and soil testing is more important than a lot of people think. Now you can also go into a field and your your nutrients are there, your pH is eh, not very good, you know just say it's, let's just say it's a 6, six L. your pH is low. Um, your corn is looking like it's got yellow leaves but you've put all the nutrients there, what is going on, you know? Um, what's what's the problem well the nutrients are there but they're not available to the plant because the pH is low and your clay content is high you'd never get rid of your clay content you just have to make that clay work for you and uh, there's two factors there organic matter which if you do beans after beans after beans after beans and even wheat and bale the straw off of it look at that sexy woman right there holy Fat, smoke see that big belly right there? Fat, Turn I don't see that you think you got a fat belly? Yeah, see it? No. Well, this is your underwear, so that's not rolls. <laughs> that's not roll. No, if you take your underwear off, I'd be happier, but the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is that terrible? She's sexy. Yeah, she's much, she's not mata butt. So anyways, um, organic matter is another one that will tie up your nutrients as well. If it's too low, you need organic matter. And that means tilling in your corn stalks. A lot of guys already know this stuff. Oh, the boy's awake. I hear him. Um, so tilling those stalks, get that soybeans, good rotations do away with uh, poor, uh, poor, uh, 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 yeah, organic matter. Compost will, will boost that organic matter, and that will, you know, make things more available to the plant. So if you're looking at your plants and they're looking peaked and they're maybe, you know, up to three feet tall, uh, you can get a foliar applied nutrient pack and you can spray that on there. Again, it's going to cost you money. It's cheaper to buy lime. It's cheaper to pay somebody to put lime on at that point because uh, those nutrient packs are pretty expensive. 50 pound bag, God, I don't even want to know what they cost anymore. Last time I bought them was for soybeans. And I always had to put that on soybeans on farms that I got from other farmers in the area. It's like, this ground is bad. I can't make a living on this ground. Where's my boy? What is that? Come on, sleepy. Ugh. So anytime I ever got ground from somebody else, it was just a depleted mess. Uh, we put hay into it, and it wasn't such a big deal. Uh, it wasn't such a big deal. And with the mulch hay business, you really don't want to be dumping a bunch of, of lime and stuff like that because the profit margins are thin. It's a volume deal. Well, everything's a volume deal now. So, anyway, those nutrient packs, we used to put them on for recovery uh, because once that corn is up and growing, you can't put lime on it. As a matter of fact, the lime spreaders, the, like Martin's Limestone is a local one we have here. I say local, it's two hours away, but they'll come out and put limestone down, lime down. Uh, they won't even go on to a plowed field. If you chisel plow the field, they either won't go on it because they don't want to get stuck, or they'll charge you more money because they don't want to be on rough plowed ground. Uh, I chisel plowed a piece of property last year, and I wanted it on there, and they're like, well, they're not going to do it. It's, they got too many unplowed fields to do. They don't want to mess with yours. And it pissed me off, and I'll never ask them to do it again, and that's fine. It's fine. I don't care. I'm a man of my own means. I will figure it out. Right, Well, You look like you just woke up. My little boy, huh? He's a handsome young guy, is he? He looks like the Wolverine with his hair, though. Don't you? He does. You just gotta get him some pork chops, right? 
You like pork chops? Okay. Yeah, okay. Such a handsome guy. So, anyway, uh, lime. Lime is your friend. Organic matter is your friend. Um, rotation is your friend. Uh, uh, full, uh, yeah. Tissue sampling will let you know if you soil test and your plants are still bad, not doing well, you can tissue sample and you can figure out what's in the soil, what's in the plant, what do I need to recover this, what's it going to cost, is it feasible to do so, and if it's not, then you're just going to have to get smart the next year. You cut your losses on it. You don't, if it's going to cost you your profit to recover a field of corn or soybeans, that won't work, dude. If it's going to cost you the profit to recover a field of soybeans or corn, um, you're better off just eh, not doing it. Let it go. Do the best you can with what you've got, but plan for next year in a positive way. Like, okay, I got this. I got a pH of 5.8. I've got nutrients that are in this soil, and I need to get this soil up and running. Get it to 6.4. Get it to 6.5. Get it to 6.6. Get it up there. Um, as far as the... Uh, there you go. As far as the uh, organic matter, that's a that's time. It's going to take you time to get that up. But anyway, I don't know if this has helped anybody. I don't know if it matters to anybody. I know that these are my experiences here over the years and years and years that I've farmed my whole entire life and the things that I've learned. And some of the shit that I've learned, nobody will ever learn. You know, it's like it's lost art. It's lost lost uh, just lost uh, no-till is a big thing right now uh, no-till farming I've done it here I think it was probably the worst thing that I've done in all honesty uh, it's not for corn so much but in soybeans we have a heavier clay soil and I always notice you know a lot of guys are like oh it's only a three to five bushel yield drag well a three to five bushel yield drag uh, right now over a hundred bucks um, and I didn't experience a three to, to three to five bushel yield drag I experienced much greater yield drag than that uh, the, the early plant vigor is not nearly as good as works ground um, the I don't know it just seemed like that plant was was fighting to get through the hard soil here and again organic matter and pH makes a big difference as to the, how the clay sets up uh, you know the soil conditions for that for that ground now zone tilling I would I would do that I would do that I was actually thinking of getting a making a rack of rippled colors and weighting the shit out of it and just punching that into the ground before I planted soybeans and uh, I know that the guy that the guys that I bought my uh, grain drill off of, they had a what was that thing, Unverfirth or Unverfirth uh, soil uh, prepper thing, and it was just rippled colders all in front of the 15 foot grain drill, and it was bolted directly in front of the hose. So you had this like six foot long or eight foot long piece that went between the hitch, and it was an extension of the hitch for the grain drill and they took it off and they put it on their brand new 1590 um, that's what they had bought in replace of the 750 that I had they bought a 1590 which had better uh, openers uh, you know the, the the row units were much better than the 750 even though the 750 had uh, a really a decent design but it has flaws uh, I figure if I'm going to go back into the soybean business, I'm going to pull all of the 750 row units off because my drill, there's nothing wrong with my drill. It's perfectly fine. It's a, you know, it drills beans and uh, the worst thing is that the row units have a lot of play in them now and, and it's just not nearly as good as they should be. So I would put 1590 row units on there. They'll bolt right up. No problem. Bolt right up. No issues. Just Put them on, go for broke. It would cost me about half of what a new grain drill would be, and you can put them on there. Uh, so, anyways, that's just what I would do. Uh, there would be some repair parts, but I'm not into that soybeans just yet. Um, years ago, we grew peas. 
uh, peas, peas and oats. Uh, might look into the peas. Uh, Welker Farms you, grows peas way out, uh, way out in, where are they, in uh, Montana, North or South Dakota, Montana, some shit like that. And I'm not even sure where they're at. I think they're in North or South Dakota. North Dakota? Wherever they are, somebody's going to tell me. Anyway, uh, we grew, I grew peas 30 years ago for the cows. We, we, we milk cows. Now, we use peas and oats. Uh, I remember combining peas with oats in them just to grind them. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty good. It's a good protein source. Uh, yeah, good protein. Protein and energy, baby. That's what it was for cows. We milk cows off of them. I only did that once on a small piece, and it was just an experiment. And, you know, the peas, the oats were there to hold the peas up. But the peas, cow peas, or, yeah, cow peas, is what they were. Canada peas, or cow peas is what we called them. Um, they will grow as a standalone, and the deer won't penetrate the field to eat them off because it's a tanglefoot mess. If you've ever seen peas in your garden grow, they have all these little feelers, and they grab one another, and they, they just... They lock shit up. And deer, they'll jump. They'll jump, but they're lazy animals. They don't really want to fight for their food. So they'll just trim off the edges, and that's that's just about it. So I was thinking into that, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I think this is long enough. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If not, you know, I'm sorry if you did. Hey, give it a thumbs up. Give it a like or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you can hit the subscribe button. It doesn't hurt anything, and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, yeah, I should do a podcast and, you know, I don't even know how I'm just mentally retarded when it comes to that. And it would just be me talking, but I would love to do like a podcast with, um, other farmers from other areas to get different views on how farming works out there. I mean, I look at the other farm channels from time to time, Welker, Millennial, uh, how farms works is probably more, I, I view those more than most um, Northern Farmer AB, and, uh, yeah, I like, I like to watch Bame Farm. Bame Farm is really where I was when I was his age or younger, and it was just like that, gluing shit together to make it work, and, you know, he, he, he needs to, he's doing okay. Let's put it this way, he's doing okay, but I'd love to go help him sometimes. It's like, my God, you're still combining corn and it's March. Let's go. You know, that's just me though. But I like I like Jacob. He's a good guy. Bandit Farmer, I watch him. Uh, he's, you know, just these small channels. Uh, of course, Timmy Corn Picker. He doesn't post as much as he used to, but, you know, he's my neighbor. Uh, he's a couple, three years younger than me. And uh, we went to the same school. Uh, I think I was a senior when he was a freshman, but... Uh, might have been a sophomore, but we didn't have anything to do with one another in school, but we've become friends, and uh, friends are hard to find. And, uh, you know, his farming is very different than mine, and uh, that's okay, because it doesn't matter. We all have to do what makes us feel good and what makes us the money to support our family. And he's in a situation uh, where he's happy. And happiness can't be bought, just so you all know. You can't buy happiness. You have to find it. And if you're looking for happiness and you're not happy with what you're doing, it's okay to change what you're doing to find that happiness, whether it's you're in a bad relationship or whether you're in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a working relationship. with you, you work with a bunch of morons. Or if you're farming and you're just not meeting your expectations of what you want to be, it's okay to change. It's okay to think outside the box. And Tim does that. He does that a lot. Um, I think it's funny because he posted on Instagram that he was going to put these peas in. I'm like, well, shit, I did that 30 years ago. And he's done it in the past, too. Uh, and growing oats in this area is... Uh, it's like a, a wave, you know, sometimes there's a wave of oats that are grown and then the tide goes out and then nobody grows oats for four or five years. And uh, I haven't grown oats now in probably 15 years and I, I really don't have a desire to grow oats. It's just not, not that I couldn't or wouldn't, it's that I would have to plant those oats where I had corn. Uh, and where I have corn, I have used atrazine and oats hate atrazine so if you're going to plant oats and you've used atrazine on your corn 
don't do it. It will severely impact your oats. You will not know what the problem is because it doesn't it doesn't even say on the atrazine. Don't use don't plant oats after corn. It just it doesn't. It's an experience thing, and some people know it and never tell anybody, and then laugh at them when the oats don't do well after they put it in after corn. And we used to do it every year, and it was like, man, these oats suck. Why does everybody else have decent oats and we got shit? Well, what is that? A spoon? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. This keeps my gut healthy, and my little boy brought it. Thank you so much. I need to kiss it. Anyway, I will eat it, and I'm going to do that now. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to. If you don't want to, don't do it. But, yeah, there you go.